Take your Bibles. We're going to read in Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 13. We'll jump around a little bit, but we'll read verses 1 through 13, 1 through 4, and then we'll go verses 7 through 13. Let's read the word of God together. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Now verse 7. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. God in heaven, we thank you that you have called us to seek Jesus, not to destroy him, but to worship him. Father, show us how to really rejoice in the Lord. Show us how to worship Jesus with all of our hearts, dear God. Father, we pray that you would bless this time, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And so we've been looking at the heart of Christmas. And for the first time, we looked at the heart of Jesus himself. And we looked at the heart of Jesus. And what we saw, along with many things, of course, Jesus' heart is perfect and so full of wonderful, loving things. But we saw giving. And we saw that giving is part of the heart of Christmas, especially to those who have great need. And then we looked at the heart of Christmas through Joseph, and we saw that obedience is a part of the heart of Christmas. Having faith, amen, even when there are divine disruptions. And so today I want us to look at the heart of Christmas through the Magi. And what we want to explore today is the subject of worship. Worship is the key to us really being able to experience a profound peace from God a profound power in God and the f profound presence of God to be able to worship. And so you really want to lessen up because there are so many people who in this season who don't have peace, who do not have the power of God, who do not have the presence of God. Even those who are in the house of God are not always in those places. And, you know, we may act like we do, but sometimes the truth will come out and we don't. I mean, we just saw this past week where this guy by the name of Twitch, who was the kind of the, the right-hand guy to Ellen DeGeneres on her show, all of a sudden he just took his life. Yeah. And one of the main things, of course, along with just the grief of it all that everyone's kind of so dumbfounded about is that he was so happy. He seemed to be so mentally healthy. He seemed to be so emotionally healthy. Everyone was so surprised and so shocked. And it just kind of speaks to one of the issues right now in the Western world that we have a way of hiding our pain, don't we? Sometimes we'll medicate it through alcohol or through drugs or whatever our, our secret little thing is that we do. But deep down inside, we're hurting. 
and then it'll come out. And, and so sometimes we're faking it, and it'll come out. And I want you to know that you can have a real peace with Christ. Amen? As long as you learn how to worship the Lord with all of your heart. Worship is the key to having the heart of Christmas. I want you to notice that it says in verse 2 that the Magi traveled to find the child Jesus so that they could worship him. You see that? And then it says when they found him in verse 11, they fell down and they did what? They worshiped him. Worship is the key to us really having that profound move of God in our lives and having the peace of God in our lives. And we have to be very careful as Christians even during the Christmas season because there's a huge temptation to focus on worshiping ourselves instead of worshiping Jesus, where we focus on what makes me happy. I want my gift now. You know what I want now. Don't mess with me now. Bring what I want. And truthfully, y'all, we ought to not be trying to spend anything on ourselves at Christmas because the truth of the matter, for most of us in this room, we have Christmas almost every month and some of us every week. We're buying clothes for ourselves and for other people. We're, we're, we're upgrading data. We're doing all kinds of things. We're buying stuff for our houses. And we're just always gifting ourselves and gifting each other. So for us to try and take Jesus' birthday and make it our own, like I'm entitled to get some, we got to watch out. But if we're not careful, we'll get into that temptation of worshiping ourselves instead of worshiping the Lord. Sometimes if we're not careful, we'll get into this thing where, hey, I just want to use the Christmas season to find a good Christmas party. I just want to turn up, okay? Where's the next good party so I can turn up? And we focus on the wrong things instead of worshiping Jesus. We're worshiping ourselves or we're worshiping people or we're worshiping places or we're worshiping things or we're worshiping stuff. Can anybody relate to what I'm talking about? We got to be careful. There was a man, he came home and he found his wife posing in front of the mirror and she had a very expensive dress on and she was looking good in it. But he was so upset, he said, babe, what are you doing? We're on a budget. We promised each other, we made a commitment that we weren't gonna buy anything like this. You know we can't afford this. We're trying to do some things. She said, I know, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, baby, but the devil made me do it. I was in the store, I tried it on, and I just heard the devil telling me, girl, you, you look so good in that dress. That's you. You got to have that dress. He said, baby, but we're Christians. You should have rebuked the devil. You should have said, get thee behind me, Satan. You know better than that. She said, well, I did. I said, get thee behind me, Satan. And when he got behind me, he said, girl, you look good back there, too. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. We put what we want above what God wants. And you know what that's called? That's called idolatry. And so we want to learn to worship Jesus with all of our hearts because when we truly learn to worship Jesus consistently, daily, and not just during the Christmas season, but all year round, we get to experience him in the most profound way, in the most unique way, where you really experience the power of God and the presence of God and the peace of God working in your life. When you make a decision that I'm going to learn to be a pure worshiper of the Lord, unadulterated, undefiled, God, you have my all, God, you have my everything. When you begin to worship Jesus only, he will begin to walk you in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's when you have that, what John calls over in 1 John, the anointing of the Spirit, where you're fully controlled by the Spirit. That means that God will give you emotional strength that you can't muster from yourself and no drug can give you. He'll give you that emotional strength to overcome depression, to overcome those moments when you feel like giving up. Because, see, the Holy Spirit really does give us comfort and joy. Amen? He really one who gives us that peace on earth and goodwill toward all men. He's the one who gives us that. Amen? And God will give you that as you begin to really decide, as we begin to really decide to worship Jesus only. When we do that, we get divine wisdom for decision-making. We get... God fighting our battles for us. We don't have to fight our battles for ourselves anymore. Some of us, we've been fighting our own battles. And when you fight your own battles, guess what? Without the strength of the Lord, it doesn't come out good. But God is able to fight our battle. He's never lost a battle, amen? When we begin to really worship the Lord with all of our heart, that means we get a victory where now we have the power to overcome and come out of bondage and not keep just living in bondage. It means the devil won't be able to intimidate you and whisper stuff in your ear and just cause you to give up. Come on now, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, amen? And Christmas 
it allows us a season like no other season to worship Christ. And so what is worship? Let me just give you a definition of worship before we even get into this. Worship, and if you look up this word in the Greek that's used here throughout this passage, it's, it's, it's a word that means prostrate. It means to lay before. It means to abandon everything. It means to lay bare everything. It means to pay homage to God. It means full allegiance. In fact, during this time when they used this word in the Greek, the word was used when it wasn't being used for worship. It was used of a dog licking his master's hand. So you understand that this means, God, I am completely surrendered to you. God, you are first. God, I am nothing. You are everything. I give you all the glory. I hold back nothing to you. I exalt you. And so as you begin to study this, and then you go into the Old Testament, you begin to look at what worship means. Worship is based on a word that means worth, that God is worth the worship. He deserves the glory. There's a unique praise and honor and homage that's given to God that no other thing should get. No other person should get. No other thing in our lives should get. Only God should get it. And so by the time you go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, here's what worship is. And you may want to write some of these down. First of all, worship is intimate. See, worship is not just about the hands. It's about the heart. In fact, God says these people, sometimes they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God is not impressed always. We get shouting and screaming, and we ain't really worshiping God. I mean, we, we, may be, we may be emotional in the moment, but we're not surrendered to God. We have idols in our lives. And so God said, mm, bless their hearts. God have a bless their heart <laughs> perspective toward us. And so worship is intimate, where I am intimate with the Lord. Let me give you a scripture that helps you to understand how you have to really guard your heart when it comes to worship. Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So a lot of times we'll think in our hearts we're worshiping because we're going to see in a minute. Herod said, he first said, hey, find the child because I want to worship him too. And we'll say all kind of things with our lips and we'll be sincere in our hearts and we'll be in our emotions. We'll be in our flesh because sometimes our flesh we think is the spirit, but it's not. But he's, he wasn't sincere at all. He was still about worshiping himself. And so you have to really guard your heart. And that leads to the next passage I want you to see in Proverbs 4 and verse 23. That verse says, to keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the very issues of life. That word keep means to survey. It means to audit. It means to check deep on it. You got to watch that heart. You got to watch what you let go through your eyes and affect your heart. And you got to, from time to time, have an inventory on your heart and make sure it's going the right way. Because what goes in the heart and you allow to stay in there and marinate and simmer and grow, everything about you will come out of that. Your attitudes, your behavior, your emotions, your perspective. So he says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it comes the issues of life. So understand, first and foremost, worship is intimate. It's personal between God and you. It's not ceremonial. It's personal. And so we can look all different types of ways on the outside when we worship, but what God is looking at most of is our hearts. Not only that, that worship is expensive. You can write that one down. It's going to cost you something, Amen. True worship does not happen without sacrifice. The first time in the Bible that the word worship is used is over in Genesis, and it has to do when Abraham takes Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him to the Lord. And remember what he tells the men at the bottom of the mountain before he leaves? He says, I and the boy, we're going to go up and we're going to worship. That's the first time the word worship is used when he's about to kill his son. Listen, we are not worshiping if we're not surrendering and sacrificing our all to the Lord. This is why Paul says to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. Worship is expensive. Here's another one. Worship is urgent. Worship is urgent. It is an issue of right now. You know, when you say, God, I'm going to worship you later, uh, are you putting him off? Yeah, that's not worship. Worship is right now. A lot of us, we say, hey, God, I'm going to do this for you when I get to this certain place. That's not worship. That's, that's you predicating what you're going to do based on when your circumstances are right. So you're actually worshiping your circumstances more than you're worshiping God. Because you're saying, I'm, I'm unable to worship God. I'm unable to tithe until I do this. I'm unable to do this until this gets to this place. I'm unable to honor my husband until this gets to this place. Oh, my goodness. It's going to get quiet up in here. <laughs> Here's another one. Worship is incessant. That means continual. 
This is why David said, I will bless the Lord at Worship doesn't just happen when we come together for a couple of hours on Sunday. Worship is while you're giving your baby a bath. Worship is supposed to happen. Everything you do, while you're sitting at your desk, it becomes a tabernacle of praise. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Worship. Not only that, here's another one. Worship is anguishing. Worship is warfare because when you begin to worship, you've got to understand that the enemy is going to come against you. And that's one of the ways you know that you're worshiping right is because it's hard. Understand, when Jesus told the disciples to pray for an hour, they could not pray. Remember what he came back and told them? He said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Why? Because the enemy will try to take away from your praise, take away from your worship every time. And then one other is that worship should be unrivaled. He says, I am the Lord your God, and you should have no other gods before me. And that's one of the challenges that we have to be careful about. When we don't really worship the Lord with all of our hearts, when we don't do the inventory on a regular basis, that our hearts begin to drift into idolatry. Did you know that? If you're not intentional to worship Jesus, your heart will naturally begin to drift into idolatry. And when your heart drifts into idolatry, you drift into a form of self-destruction. Whenever there's idolatry, you've got four things that are always going on whenever there's idolatry. You have fear. You have misplaced trust, and you have self-destruction. Let me look at my notes for this last one. <laughs> and you have bondage. And you have bondage. And, and that happens when we begin to allow our hearts astray from worshiping Christ. Remember what happened with Elijah and the prophets of Baal? In fact, I don't even want to go there. I want to go to what Sinitra was talking about. She was talking about Elijah and the widow. And the widow had already made up her mind in her own strength, I'm going to take care of me and my child, and then we're going to die. God told her, put me first, and she lived. Now, here's the question. If she would have done it her way and not put God first, do you think she would have died? She would have died. And a lot of us are dying because we don't put God first. And so you've got to understand what God is saying. When Elijah and the prophets of Baal, remember when, when Elijah told Ahab, listen, bring those 450 prophets to Mount Carmel. We're going to have it out right here. And they came and all the people came and the people were waiting to see who was going to win. Instead of siding with God and with Elijah, they said, we're going to wait and see. But Elijah said, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a sacrifice on the altar and you're going to cry out to your God. And if your God answers and, and just puts fire down on that sacrifice, then, then your God is true. But then if if I cry out to God and my God brings fire down on the altar, then my God is true. And y'all remember what happened? Yes. They cried out to God. Yes. Nothing happened. Yes. Elijah said, it's my turn. Put more water on it. He just filled the whole thing with water. And he said, oh, Lord God, you are great and you are mighty. <laughs> the fire just came down. But do you remember what happened to the prophets of Baal? Not, not after that, but before that. As they began to cry out, they had started that morning crying out. It says they cried out until noon. It says that when they were not getting a responsible response from an idol, from a false god, they began to cut themselves. They began to self-destruct. This is what happens when we worship false idols. We hurt ourselves. We hurt our children. We hurt our legacy. We cut ourselves. We self-destruct. And so it's so important that we understand what real worship is. And I love the heart of the Magi and what we can learn about having a whole heart that's dedicated to worshiping Jesus. And so I want us to give us some things here that we can look at that will check our hearts so that we can have a heart that purely worships Jesus at Christmas time. First thing I want you to see, the first word, I want to give you three words to hang these thoughts on as we look at the Magi very quickly. The first word is presence. And it has to do with God's presence. You can write that down, presence. It says in verse 1 that the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They came from Jerusalem to worship him. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? So you've got to understand that these wise men, and it's normally we call them three wise men, and we're not sure how many there are. The only reason they call them three wise men, Bible scholars, there's nothing really in the scripture that says there were three of them. It could have been as many as 20 of them, could have been 12 of them, no one knows for sure. But the reason they kind of believe that there were three was because there were three distinct gifts given. There was gold, frankincense, and myrrh that was given. 
but you've got to understand that these were men who studied the stars and they studied science, but they didn't stop there. They were also spiritual men. So they, they, they didn't see a conflict between the spiritual and the science. And I don't know how much they knew about the, 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 the Jewish people and the Messiah who was was supposed to come but they knew enough that when they began to study and as they were looking up and studying the stars they saw this one bright star and they knew it was not just a scientific phenomenon but they knew that God was speaking and as a result they started a journey and you've got to understand something about this journey this journey took as much as two years for them to get to where Jesus was so this took time these were dignitaries these were wealthy men these were men of distinction. These were men who were revered in their own community. They were probably from Babylon, so it, they, they came a long distance. But it lets us know that one of the ways you keep your heart worshiping the Lord is that you pursue the Lord. You pursue his presence. Even if it takes a long time to get to him, even if it takes a lot to get to him, you still get to him because they were dedicated to come and to do what? And to worship the Lord. And the Lord wants us to make sure that we're dedicating our time to giving him glory. We've got to be very careful with our time. As Christians, your time does not belong to you. My time does not belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. And this is why Paul says over in Ephesians 5, he says we're supposed to redeem the time yeah. because the days are evil. Yeah. And when he says that, he's saying to be careful to use your time doing things that God wants you to do with your time. Not what we want to do. Not what the world is pulling us to do and telling us to do. You know, but what God wants us to do, we have to really be strategic. Be careful to use your time doing things that God wants you to do. These men made a major commitment that we are going to go and worship the Lord. We're going to seek out his presence. Have you made time during this Christmas season to seek out his presence? Just to set some time aside in the midst of all the hustle and bustle and all the shopping and all that, just to get together with family to open the word, to read the Christmas story, and just to spend time worshiping Jesus, having your own silent night. And this is what they were able to do. God wants us to redeem the time because in that same verse over in Ephesians 5, it says that the days are evil, and that means that each day has potential for evil, and each day has potential for good. This is a stewardship issue for us as Christians because we live in a fallen world with fallen people. And Satan is constantly scheming to steal and to kill and to destroy. And so we need our days to intentionally combat the evil. That's what we're called to do. We're called to intentionally combat the evil and to redeem our time. Because the most important commodity that you have to steward is your time. It's not your money. It's not even your relationships. And it's not that those things aren't important, but listen, if you don't have time to use them, they're irrelevant. And so the tricky part is that none of us really knows how much time we have. And this is why you have to be very careful when you start putting off really worshiping the Lord, really bringing him your all, really honoring him with everything that you have, because we don't know how much time we have. If you are 16 years old here, I'm looking around, I don't know. But if you are 16 years old, but you're only going to live until you're 19, then guess what? You are pretty old. But if you're 50 years old, you're going to live till you're 90. Guess what? You're still pretty young. And this is the challenge with time. None of us knows. And Paul says there's a sense of urgency to be careful to use our time to pursue after the Lord. Not only God's presence, but I love this, my pride. The first word is presence. The second word is pride. As you do inventory on your heart to make sure you're going to be a worshiper, check for pride. Amen. Now look at this in verse 13. It says the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream. He tells Joseph to go to Egypt because Herod is trying to destroy Jesus. And you say, well, I thought Herod was trying to find Jesus so that he could worship Jesus. No, no, no. No. Look at verse 16. Herod, when he saw that he had been deceived by the wise men, he was very angry. Herod had a lot of pride. He was consumed with himself. You've got to understand who Herod was. Herod is no notorious and nefarious of his time. He would kill his own family members. He killed three of his own children. If they didn't honor him right, or he, he just didn't care. Herod persecuted Christians. 
There is so much written about him. And so Herod is a very self-indulged man. And here he's angry. And this is how we know when we're slipping into idolatry. When the pride is slipping in, it's when we begin to get angry because things don't go our way. And so it becomes all about me. And look at this. I begin to work against the will of God instead of working for the will of God. It says, look at verse 16 again. It says that he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years and under. And so you have to really guard yourself from pride because when we get so consumed in pride, we begin to elevate our agenda above God's agenda. And when we do that, hey, it always leads to some type of death and destruction. The scripture tells us to guard our hearts from pride. And you have to be very intentional about that. Self has to be died, has to die every day. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but the life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God. How, how often do you need to crucify yourself every day? Jesus said, take up your cross daily. And every day I have to get before the Lord and say, Lord, get self, get Kevin, get flesh out of the way. I mean, I just, I just had a birthday last week, and it was so interesting. I woke up early that morning before anybody else, and I had devotion, Pastor Judah. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you to remember something about this day today, Kevin. It's not about you. <laughs> On my birthday. <laughs> but the Lord spoke it to me, said, even when it's about you, it's not about you. And the Lord didn't want me to get out of pocket with some sense of entitlement or somewhere. I miss his calling to love and honor my wife, serve my children, to be a servant for the kingdom of God, even on that day. And man, he just put me in check like that. But that's something we need to understand that it's never about us if we're a child of God. And we have to really make sure we keep that pride off. And so I heard someone say that pride is like a beard. You have to shave it every day. Because it just keeps coming back. And ladies, you can just apply that however you want to apply it. Amen. <laughs> Pride is tricky because we don't come flat out and say, I want to be worshipped. We don't say, I want the glory. We don't say, God, I want things my way as opposed to your way. We say things like, this is an exception. That's what we say. We use that word exception a lot. We use that concept of exception a lot in the kingdom. I'm talking about Christian people. I know God said this, but God, I know you said that based on this person I'm dating and they're not a Christian, I shouldn't marry them, but this may be my last chance. So I'm going to marry him anyway. I'm going to marry her anyway. And God says they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. We say, God, I know I don't have biblical grounds for a divorce to get out of this marriage, but Lord, this ain't working. And so I'm going to go through with this anyway. God, this is an exception, and so you've got to understand my heart because I'm going to divorce him. I'm going to divorce her. We say, God, I know I made a commitment to tithe, but it's Christmas, or I have bills, and so this is an exception, God, and your real faith, you got to understand, your real faith is determined in the exceptions. I mean, that's why God keeps bringing up the exceptions. And the longer you keep giving in to the exceptions, the more you're going to stay stuck in that same place and you're not going to grow by faith. The more you're going to stay in that place of idolatry and not really worship the king of glory. I don't expect a lot of amens from this. I get it. I know this is hard. But we got to understand so that we can be the people of God going into the new year that God wants us to be. we got to shake that fear off. And so we see that my presence, my pride, and then one more is my possessions. It says in verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Verse 11, when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. They fell down in worship, and when they opened their treasures God knows what our treasures are right those things we cherish the most and he says I want you to open them up to me 
And so if we're going to do inventory on this heart and keep our heart we have, and make sure that we're worshipers, we've got to make sure that we're pursuing his presence. We're using our time for his glory. We've got to make sure that we're staying clear of pride, but also we've got to make sure that we're not holding on to possessions Amen. more than other things. Amen. Yeah. Remember that scene in that Indiana Jones movie when Indiana Jones is uh, at, the, at the end of the movie, and this is the one about the, uh, the, the, the goblet that's supposed to be the, the cup that Christ drank from. And, 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 and all through the movie, he's been trying to get this, this, this cup. And finally, at the end, the cup falls down. And, the, you know, they're inside the volcano. And, you know, it's cracked open. The cup's down there. It looks like Andy's going to risk everything to try and get it. He's about to maybe fall in. But he's just stretching, stretching, stretching. And then someone says to him, Andy, let it go. And, you know, that's what some of us have to do as well. We're stretching, stretching, stretching for a treasure. And God says, hey, let it go. Open that treasure to me. It says they opened their treasure. They laid down their possessions. And that's when you begin to really hear the voice of the Lord correctly. Did you notice how they had to hear the voice of the Lord and they heard it correctly because they were worshiping the Lord? They didn't let treasures get in the way. Now, understand, they had the opportunity to believe the voice of Satan was through Herod because Herod told them, hey, when you find out where the child is, come back to me. But then in a dream, God spoke to them and they could delineate between God speaking and the devil speaking. Sometimes when we can't delineate between God speaking and the devil speaking and we're all confused, it's because we haven't laid it down. And so they were able to delineate and know which one was the voice of God, even though the dream seemed to be more vague, more opaque, but they knew it was from God. God said, don't go back to Herod because he's trying to destroy the child. And so they laid it down. I love this because they fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus. They worked in favor with Jesus and they laid it down as opposed to working against Jesus. And God calls us to lay down our treasures. And so what is your treasure that you need to lay down before the Lord? What is my treasure that I need to lay down before the Lord? I have gone through this Christian journey for about 40 years now. And all along the way, including recently, I've had to always be careful to lay down treasures and to lay them down again and make sure that I'm worshiping the king of glory, not worshiping money, not worshiping ambition, not worshiping any of the wrong things that I shouldn't be worshiping. And it's a constant work. Like you say, you've got to deal with it every day. You've got to shave that pride off. But God wants us to lay it down. Let's bow before the Lord. And as we're bowing before the Lord... What do you need to lay down? What do we need to lay down and worship the Lord so that we can have real worship? Do we need to lay down money? Do we need to lay down status? Do we need to lay down idolizing people where, Lord, I just want people to like me, to admire me. And so... I bend out way too far to try to impress people and please people. Do we need to lay down ambition? I want the bigger, I want the better. I have a house, but I want a bigger house and a better house. I have a car, but I want a bigger car and a better car. I have clothes, but I want a bigger and better wardrobe. I want a bigger and better bank account. I want a bigger and better business. I want a bigger and better career. And the Lord tells us that he wants us to learn to be content and learn how to worship him in whatever circumstance we're in. Jesus, we want to have a pure worship towards you in this Christmas season. I just want to, on behalf of our congregation, ask you to forgive us, dear God, for how we, we get seduced by the world and we begin to um, uh, re recall the same things they're recalling, have the same attitudes and perspectives that they have around this Christmas season. And Jesus, this is all about worshiping you, the King of glory. And so as you came into the world and you gave your all, help us to use this season to give you our all, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would just refresh us. And like David, dear Lord, we pray that you would search us and know our hearts. 
Uh, test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there's anything offensive in us and lead us in the way everlasting, dear God, that our worship may be pure. It may be pleasing to you, dear God. It may be sincere and wholehearted, dear God. Jesus, we worship you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, <laughs> he loves you so much. This is why he was born for you. This is why he became a man. He did not do it for himself, but he did it so that he could save us, save me and save you. And if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, would you do that today by simply saying, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Say that to him now. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Say, Jesus, now I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Say, thank you for saving me, Jesus. Thank you. Father God, we bless you and we praise you and we thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.